Hello, I'm Anthony Chan. I'm a consultant rheumatologist from London, United Kingdom, and I'm here at EULA 2023 in Milan reporting for Room Now. It's been a very interesting uh, day two here at EULA 2023. And today I would like to share with you uh, some of the key highlights from the meeting, particularly looking at the impact of biologic therapies in rheumatoid arthritis. The first is uh, an oral presentation, 103, uh, from Professor Andy Cope from London. And this is from the APIPRA study. One of the questions that we often ask is whether early use of biologic therapies in patients who have clinically suspect arthritis uh, and people who have risks of developing rheumatoid arthritis, such as being seropositive and having tender or swollen joints, would benefit from early treatment before having fully established rheumatoid arthritis, whether there's a possibility of preventing the full development of rheumatoid arthritis. So in the PIPRA study, they used a Batisap and they treated patients who clinically suspect arthritis with predictors of possible development of rheumatoid arthritis in the future. So these patients had low disease activity and the treatment was for a year where they received a Batisap. At the end of the one year of treatment of a Batisap in these patients, 6% from the original group developed rheumatoid arthritis. Now this is much lower compared to the placebo arm where the 29% of these patients develop rheumatoid arthritis. Subsequently, post one year of treatment, these patients were followed up and in 25% of the original group uh, went on to develop rheumatoid arthritis, which is still lower than the placebo group, which was 37%. The effect was seen most in patients who had seropositivity, especially for ACPA, where the effect was even greater in terms of the prevention by early treatment with a Batisap. So this study shows that it is possible to consider uh, biologics such as a Batisap in this case, that could help prevent the progression and development of rheumatoid arthritis in patients with clinically suspect rheumatoid arthritis, especially in people who have uh, ACPA positivity. So that was an interesting finding from EULA23 today. The next study is uh, another oral presentation, OP128, and this is about the use of methotrexate in combination with uh, adalimumab. Now, we use a lot of methotrexate uh, as co-therapy with uh, TTNFs, uh, and in this study measured the, looked at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of methotrexate, in particular, uh, the polyglutamates, or PGs, of methotrexate, which is part of the metabolism of methotrexate. It's something that they measured to see whether the amount of polyglutamates affected firstly the efficacy and secondly the adverse events in patients who were also receiving adalimumab. And this was part of the miracles uh, study where they had over 300 patients and the primary outcome they were looking for was the SDI at week 24, which is the disease activity uh, index. And in this study, they showed that the the level of methotrexate polyglutamates had no significant impact in terms of the efficacy uh, in patients who um, were receiving methotrexate in combination with adalimumab. However, with regards to adverse events, if patients had a higher level of methotrexate polyglutamates that predicted worse outcome in terms of adverse events compared to a lower level of methotrexate polyglutamates. So again, this study shows that it's, it is possible to consider the, the measurement of such a, a marker or to consider a, um, other measures to try to reduce the uh, adverse events that might be resulting from the use of methotrexate in patients who are also receiving uh, a TNF inhibitor, in this case, adalimumab. The uh, next interesting study um, uh, was from... Uh, Another oral presentation today, um, 129, which is a study looking at the use of etanercept for six months in patients who had early rheumatoid arthritis in the CARE RA study, where they use a regime called the COBRA SLIM regimen. And the COBRA SLIM regimen involved patients taking metotrexate 15 milligram once a day 
and then they had a step down uh, of prednisolone starting at 30 milligram and then dropping all the way down to five milligrams over a period of time. And they looked at the patients who managed to achieve uh, DAS28 um, remission and those who had an insufficient response. And in those patients who had an insufficient response after a period of time where they were enrolled into the Cobra Slim uh, program, and they went on to have uh, six months of etanercept therapy, while in the other arm, they continued with the standard treatment. And it showed that the addition of uh, six months of additional um, etanercept, uh, this is the Cobra Slim bioinduction phase, did not have any significant impact in these patients compared to those who had standard therapy. Although on further analysis in the people who receive etanercept had uh, fewer advanced therapies later on, and also most of them were on um, single conventional uh, synthetic DMATs or uh, they were on monotherapy with CS uh, DMATs. So this study showed that while they did not have a significant impact in terms of the overall, it did help with reduction of the use of advanced therapies at a later stage. So that was uh, quite an interesting um, finding from the, the uh, KRA study. And the next one was uh, oral presentation 131, where they looked at dose optimization. And this is something that we often do in our clinics. Once patients achieve uh, low activity scores or disease remission, we consider the possibility of doing biologic dose reduction. And here, this was something that was based on disease activity. So the dose optimization was related to disease activity and, and this guided the dose optimization. This was a 10-year uh, study where they followed patients where they had a reduction from the full dose, 100%, to 60%, 50%, 33%, and then down to zero uh, over time. And patients were then assessed to see whether it's possible to go all the way or they would stop at the, at the range where it was appropriate for their disease activity. There were 170 patients in this study uh, called the DRESS study. Uh, and these patients were found to that in half of these patients, uh, nearly 50%, there was the possibility of doing dose reduction uh, with TNF over a period of time based on their disease activity. And this then resulted in stable disease once the patients were able to dose reduce. And this shows the um, possibility of doing this, but to do this in relation to the disease activity rather than a fixed regimen. So again, it shows that it's possible to do dose optimization uh, in these patients. And coming back to uh, the metotrexate a story again, there was lots of uh, uh, important information. And here at ULA23, one more was the use of uh, uh, metotrexate, whether it made any uh, impact in uh, patients receiving JAK inhibitors. We do use a lot of the metotrexate in combination with TNF in a, in a poster, poster 0822. They looked at a group of patients who received metotrexate uh, with TNF and another group uh, with metotrexate with, um, with a JAK inhibitors. They found uh, they, they use uh, ultrasound, grayscale, and also power Doppler as a measure of the efficacy in patients who had metotrexate and those who did not have metotrexate, both in the TNF and the JAK inhibitor group. What they found that in patients who did not receive metotrexate in combination with either TNF or a JAK inhibitor, they had worse ultrasound scores uh, in the follow-up uh, study. But this was most marked in the, um, in the JAK group where they, those uh, patients who were on JAK inhibitors but did not receive metotrexate had a worse outcome with the, with the um, ultrasound scores on grayscale and power Doppler compared to TNF, the TNF group. So this reminds us that uh, metotrexate um, is synergistic uh, with the treatment and uh, should be considered, especially in patients with active disease. Uh, they, should, they should be co-prescribed uh, in combination with TNF and possibly with a JAK inhibitor from this information that we are seeing here today. So a lot of interesting uh, findings on, uh, on biologics and small molecules uh, here at ULA23. Um, and I hope that uh, these will help us to kind of shape some of our decision making and thinking and, and also monitoring of our patients in the long term. I'm Anthony Chan reporting from uh, ULA2023 here in Milan. 
Polumna.